Just like I'm sure many of you, as a child, um, I loved a number of things about Christmas and the Christmas season. As I went about my growing up years, uh, I enjoyed, of course, the anticipation of what I would get. The anticipation of family and friends gathering together around a common table. The, uh, the singing of new songs and uh, a different uh, step, I guess, in the community as people would uh, shower one another with gifts, even those that didn't know one another. One of the, uh, I would say, probably special to me uh, traditions of our family, we would gather on Christmas Eve, and certainly I loved the gifts and the gathering, but from when I was probably six or seven or eight years old to just a young teen, uh, me and my cousin Chad, who was just a year older than me, would... Uh, find ourselves every year in this uh, match, this duel with my older brother who was four years older than me and my first cousin Cole who was his age. So it was the young against the old in, uh, and kids don't try this at home, in a firework duel. <laughs> every year we would collect fireworks all year during uh, Fourth of July and whenever they were selling fireworks and we would have our stash, our box, of fireworks. Me and Chad would collect our fireworks and Todd and Cole would collect their fireworks and, and Christmas Eve it was on and we would rush through our presents and rush through the meal because we knew that, that it was our turn to win. As you can imagine, the older, my older brother and cousin would always outdo us. They were always better at their strategy and their tactics. They had more money, let's just face it, to buy more fireworks. That's what it really was. Each year, my cousin and I would just dig a, di a deeper uh, trench because that's how we could hide and escape the Roman candles and the, the, all the different fireworks they had uh, collected. Finally, one year, I, I talked to Chad about this uh, trench that we could build that we could actually be almost completely under the ground and certainly we would not be gotten then. And my cousin Chad said, I've had it with digging trenches. I've got a plan. It was a risky plan, but he began to tell me about how I would be the distraction. I would have the five or six Roman candles in my hands, notice my hands, and I would light them, and I would be the diversion, the distraction, and he would sprint to their box of fireworks. It was a risky plan. And the night came, and, and I was visibly nervous because we had no trench. We had no defense mechanism and as the bell sounded, or however we started the firework duel, please don't try this, teenagers. <laughs> I lit the Roman candles, and he sprinted with a cherry bomb. And he heaved the cherry bomb into the box of fireworks, and all mangum broke loose. <laughs> we were, for the first time, and as I remember it, the only time, victorious <laughs> on Christmas Eve. The money that they had spent, it was glorious. I just got to relive it for you for a little bit. They had connived and they had planned and they had beat us into submission. But we took a risk and it paid off. And a glorious 20-second firework display went. They dove for the hills or the rows. We danced like it was 1999. We were kings for a night. I was just a little excited that night, and now I'm reliving it. It was awesome. We took a risk. Uh, probably one a little different than the one we're talking about today. Risk-taking mission and service. During the month of October and early November, as a church family, we're walking through and discerning of what it means to be a fruitful church. A bishop in the United Methodist Church who is presiding in Missouri, Bishop Robert Snazy, wrote a book, Five Practices of Fruitful Congregations. Five regular practices of fruitful congregations. And really, it was his observations over the years of being a bishop and a large church pastor that as he visited congregation after congregation after congregation, he could separate the churches into those that were fruitful and those who were not so much. 
And as he studied and learned and the Lord spoke through him, he came up with these five practices of fruitful congregations. Radical hospitality. Not just nice, not just polite, not just southern charmish, but radical hospitality. Please come in. Please be welcome. Passionate worship. Churches that were uh, overly fruitful had passionate, endearing Authentic worship. Intentional faith development, the third one. Churches that were uber fruitful were intentional about the way they went about their faith development. Intentional faith development. And a fourth one, this Sunday. Churches that were fruitful or are fruitful embark on risk-taking mission and service. And finally next week, uh, churches that are fruitful are extravagant in their generosity. So this Sunday, what does it mean to be a church that endeavors to take risks in mission and service? Risk-taking mission and service. I couldn't help but the minute I read this chapter, and I hope you've been following along in our 40 days of living in our Bishop Snazy's devotional that you got a couple of weeks ago. There's still copies in the back. You can pick up where we are today. As I read through those devotionals, as I, as I prayed about, as I read the chapter again from Snazy's book, I couldn't help but think of Jesus' prophecy. We have to be careful not to call this a parable. Because it's not a parable. Look again at Matthew chapter 25. A parable is like the lost son or the lost coin. The kingdom of God is like... A prophecy, a prophetic word is, is a vision or a statement of what will happen. And Jesus says here that when the Son of Man enters his kingdom, it will be like this. So Jesus is speaking of what is to come. And I put before you this morning in the heart of Christ is what is happening in today's world. A separating of those who embark on risk-taking mission and service and those who do not. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. First Church Menden, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we ask ourselves, how can we be the most effective church that Jesus Christ would be most proud of, this is the passage we should look to. We have decades and centuries of effective ways of being the church. When we think about being the church, too often we think about how can we be the church, meaning the church on the corner or the church down the street. How can we build a church? How can we build bricks and mortar? Those are all wonderful things. But when you ask me, your pastor, how can we be the church? Matthew 25, we feed the hungry. We give those who are thirsty something to drink. We clothe the naked. We go to those who are sick. We seek out those who are imprisoned and we seek to make them feel loved and comforted so that they might be set free. Risk-taking mission and service. It is being the church. It is the church. Now, that calls to mind maybe we uh, should be called a church or shouldn't be called a church then. Maybe just a group of good people who sing songs. Because being the church is feeding, is clothing, is inviting in, and is sending out. And if you are not, if we are not doing that, then we are not the church. The bold word that the Lord has, I believe, for us today is that question of, will we continue to be the church? I have to tell you, after being here a year and a half, I am very proud to call this First United Methodist Church of Minden because I see us feeding the hungry. Literally feeding the hungry. 
I see us giving those who are thirsty water. I see us clothing the naked, both with material, like actual clothes, and both with the love of Christ and that which is the most appropriate of garments. I see us visiting those who are sick. I see us going out to visit the imprisoned. And this passage of Scripture is not for us to sit back and go, okay, we are the church, so we're good. It's for us to say, how can we further the kingdom? How can we continue to be the church? How can we seek even greater ways to feed and to give water and to clothe and to invite in and send out and visit? As I prayed through this message and what it means to preach a message on risk-taking mission and service, I couldn't help but be drawn to Romans chapter 12. As your pastor, I'm a big fan of staying in one passage. I just want you to know that. Because there's enough meat and, and bone for us to chew on for hours just in this Matthew 25 passage. But I was repeatedly drawn back to this passage in Romans. Which for me is this dichotomy, which is just a big word for uh, something that can show us that it's easy to fall on both sides of the fence of Matthew 25 as a people and as a culture. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore I urge you, this is Paul's words to the church in Rome, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, His pleasing, and His perfect will. As I think about my own life, my own family, as I think about our church family, and as I think about our community and our world, I think that it is very risky to be a true follower of Christ in today's world. Very risky to feed those who are hungry. Very risky to offer those who are thirsty something to drink. Very risky to find someone who's naked and clothe them. Amen? Risky to go and visit the stranger or the sick. And visit. very risky to go and visit and love on the imprisoned. And so therefore, it is very comfortable and conforming to not do so. Do you follow me? It is very comfortable and it is very much culturally appropriate for us not to do those things. For us to pass those things by. To think that it's someone else's problem or someone else's business or the fact, you know, they got themselves in that situation. So they're really just getting what they deserve. And so therefore I am absolved of my feeding or offering. But brothers and sisters, I see no qualifications in Matthew 25. I only see hungry people that need feeding, thirsty people that need something to drink, naked people that need clothing, strangers who needed inviting in and sick, and in prison that need visiting and loving. No qualifications. And so we're faced this morning as a church family with this passage of scripture that's been gifted to us to ask the question, are we conforming to the patterns of this world? Or are we being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? And when we are being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are engaged in risk-taking mission and service. And it is a benchmark of a fruitful congregation. It reminded me of a story. My, one of my favorite preachers is Tony Campolo, this Italian Southern Baptist evangelist that spits on everybody on the front first couple of rows. He's awesome, full of fire and passion. He told about a, a group of students who went from the seminary college that he teaches at. He says there were 35 students from a school of missions in Pennsylvania who went to a Central American country. 
They went to a small town and they conducted a vacation Bible school there. Uh, pretty normal, I mean outside uh, the lines of comfortable, but, but lots of organizations and churches do this type of mission work in third world countries, right? While they were there, they did various mission projects. They interacted with the people of the town. They noticed that the children had no shoes. They also noticed uh, a lot of old used tires in the town. So they discussed the situation and decided to start a business of taking used tires to make sandals for the kids. While they did their work there, while they invested in that community, while they were about risk-taking mission and service, they got to know the people. They noticed that no one was present in the town during the day. They inquired around and found that both adults and children were working at a nationally owned factory. They were doing manual labor, even children, eight to ten hours a day. They went there to, to see and to visit their new friends. And they saw deplorable working conditions in what we would refer to now as a sweatshop. The students went back to the mission leaders with the story to see what could be done. They came up with a risky plan. They came up with a plan that each of these students would buy one stock in this nationally renowned and owned company. They found out when the next shareholders meeting would be and they showed up, risk and all. When time came for new business, all of the students stood up and said, We come in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because this company is involved in great injustice. They described the conditions of the Central American company, country and the sweatshop that was owned by this corporation there. They had pictures and a slideshow of this sweatshop. The company listened. The company formed a team which involved several of the students to evaluate the situation to make things better. To date, this company has invested $30 million in this Central American country and town. Today, this company employs double of what it did when they got involved, employs 900 people from this Central American town, all because some college students went to a town to do a VBS and began to know and love the people. And I believe, brothers and sisters, began to be the church. Risk-taking mission and service. What does it look like to you? Sometimes, like Jamie referred to in her children's message, sometimes when we think of that, we think far off, far reaching. I just told you a story about a Central American country. But what does it look like here to you and to me? I think it looks like the community lunch. I think it looks like people stepping out in faith and saying, we need a new place for our children to hear the gospel story, to hear about Abraham and Moses. Let's build this expensive yet needed building. I think it looks like a pumpkin patch. I think it looks like housing evacuees after a horrendous storm like, like you did a number of years ago. I think it looks like raising millions and millions and millions of dollars as a community for kids that we will never know that are treated at St. Jude. I think those are just a few things that we can celebrate that I see in this community, in this church family, that are very much risk-taking. That's not the norm. And so, what does it look like to our Lord? What does risk-taking mission and service look like to our Lord in our context? First, I would tell you that from what I've read to you today and studied this week, risk-taking mission and service is just not normal. It's not normal. And Paul tells us not to be normal, praise the Lord. He tells us to be transformed by the radical Holy Spirit, which is Jesus in you. He tells us to be sheep, not goats. Several years ago, 2013, my family and I went to family camp. Uh, it's a Pine Cove ministry over in Tyler, Texas. Maybe you've heard of it before. It's an ecumenical, non-denominational Christian camp that does wonderful ministry with all ages. 
there's a week-long family camp that you can go to in my my family, Shelly and I and the kids, uh, we went on this, this journey in 2013. We left after church, probably after a sermon a lot like this, and got in our, our car and headed that way. And as we exited the interstate, I-20 in Tyler, we saw a man, much like you've probably witnessed before, hungry, needs, need anything. Any help, any help is appreciated. I knew that what time registration was, I knew we needed gas, I knew we needed things to do, and so I just cordially didn't look at the guy even though I had seen him, and I took a left, and as we were going under the interstate, Nick, my son, said, Daddy, why aren't we stopping? Goat. Why aren't we stopping, Daddy? You've got to turn around, Daddy. Ugh. That was my sigh. That's what Shelly says. What's wrong, Brian? We turned around and Nick showed me that we already had food in the car that we had bought that we had not eaten. He said, Daddy, give him this and give him this. It's not necessarily to celebrate my awesome son. It's to actually point out the fact that it's very easy to be a goat. And it's not normal to be a sheep. It's not normal to be one who seeks out risk-taking mission and service. As I think about our culture, it is very normal and accepted to find ways to be more comfortable, not to be more uncomfortable. And so we have to work. We have to plan. We have to dream dreams and see visions and ways to be those who embark on risk-taking mission and service. Really, that's my second point in all of this, is risk-taking mission and service is uncomfortable. It's not normal, and it is very uncomfortable. Matter of fact, one of the ways I would just tell you that I evaluate my own life, take this on yourself as you'd like, but the way I evaluate my own life is if I am comfortable, if I am in a place where I'm going, boy, this is just, ah, then I'm probably not engaged in risk-taking mission and service. That's from my own heart. Because risk-taking mission and service is being transformed by the gospel. And usually when I'm being transformed by the gospel, I'm going, okay, Lord, and I'm being drugged there by my Lord. When I was a youth pastor in Denham Springs, First United Methodist Church of Denham Springs, just outside of Baton Rouge, I was I mean a young man, 20, 21 years old, and newly married, and we had a growing youth ministry there, and uh, there was a shotgun house right across the street from our gym, and Miss Alice, an 86-year-old, petite, Pentecostal lady lived in that house. Every time I came to the church and left the church and came to the church and left to the church, Miss Alice was on her front porch. Her claim to fame is she was 86 years old and she weighed 86 pounds. She was the only woman I ever found that would tell me her weight. Every time I passed by, I would wave at Miss Alice. And I really felt like I was Miss Alice's friend, even though I had never in my life spoken to Miss Alice. Finally, a couple of days went by, and I didn't see Miss Alice on her porch. And then teenagers came to youth ministry, and they said, What's, where's that, that lady? You know that old lady that sits on the porch? Where, is she okay? I said, well, let's go see. So we walked over to Miss Alice's house, and we knocked on her door. We had a very, heard a very feeble and faint come in. As me and 12 other teenagers busted up into this little shotgun house warmed by an old stove we found Miss Alice in her recliner unable to get up as we visited with Miss Alice we realized that something had happened the last couple of days in her life she was not the same waving lady that she had been in the past so naturally I began to inquire what had changed why she wasn't on her porch she said well pastor I had to make a decision this month if I was going to buy my medication or buy my insure. And because of my blood, blood pressure and because of my heart condition, I can't go without my medication. So I gave up my insure, and now I, 
I'm not strong enough to walk. I looked at my teenagers at the time, and I knew what they wanted to say in front of Miss Alice, but I ushered them out, and I told her we would pray with them. And before I could get out the door, the teenager was saying, Brian, we, we have to do something. We can, we can buy her, her, her insure, her, her drinks that she needs. Go back in there and ask her how much it costs a week. I went back in to Miss Alice, and it was $86 a week for her insure. I came out and I walked across there and I said, guys, it's $86 a week. And I was already thinking in my head of the leaders I could go to, much like in this congregation, say, I need help with this person. And before we got into the gym to start youth that night, they said, we'll raise it. We'll do it. And for the next 11 months, the teenagers at First United Methodist Church, Denham Springs, raised over $100 a week for Miss Alice's insurer. Risk-taking mission and service is not normal. It is uncomfortable. But risk-taking mission and service, it looks like the gospel. It is the gospel. Jesus fed thousands, and the disciples said, but where will we get the bread? Jesus healed the lepers, and they said, but Jesus, they're unclean. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And, and the disciples and people said, wait a minute, what will they say? Jesus said, let's go over to the other side. And it was at the other side. And on the other side of the Sea of Galilee where the man named Legion who had ten or more demons encountered freedom. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're called to be the church. We're called not to dig deeper trenches and hope for the best. But we're called to come up with a plan, a vision, and to sprint toward that goal. With Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our provider, the ones who's promised us if we'll follow him faithfully, then anything we ask in the Lord's name, it will be given to us. We're called to embark on that risk-taking mission and service. Yesterday, we had more pumpkins delivered to our church. No shaking heads right now, okay? More pumpkins. Richard Twyman called me and said, Brian, we have a new, de new delivery of pumpkins. And I said, Richard, are you sure we need more pumpkins? They were to be here yesterday at 11, and if you were watching the clock or the rain, it was raining at 11 o'clock yesterday, so at 10.45, a few of us gathered here, and we began to, to unload 200-plus pumpkins, 276 to be exact. <laughs> As we were about halfway through, the teenage girls that helped us on our first day of unloading showed up from the Youth Challenge program from Camp Minden. The same sweet souls from all over Louisiana who many by court order are at the Youth Challenge program at Camp Menden came, got off and out of their vans, were being drenched with rain, helped us unload all the pumpkins, and we had hot dogs and chips, and all that had been orchestrated by wonderful people here. As they sat in our Wesley room, as they ate their hot dogs and their chips, after being here just a second time, they said, Pastor, we love your church. Could we see your sanctuary? So, ten at a time, they came in here, and, and I wish you could have seen and been a fly on the wall to see the looks on their faces as they entered this room. And time after time, they said, oh, I would just love to come to church here. I would give anything to come to church here. And we went down in the basement. And Jason opened the basement up for them. And they signed their names on the wall and they shot pool. And for a moment, 
They felt like just regular teenage girls again. And this church was about visiting those who, for now, are imprisoned. All because of this radical idea, risky idea of having a pumpkin patch. I don't know what we'll earn from our pumpkin patch, and I really don't care. Because those moments are the most fruitful. So this message is a challenge to you and a challenge to me. But it's also a thank you for being a church that's willing to embark on risk-taking mission and service. We are better and we are more fruitful when we are the church that Jesus Christ is calling to feed and to give drink and to visit and to send out. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may we continue to be His church. Amen. Amen. And amen.